Okay, so welcome back to the TRT and Hormone Optimization YouTube channel. And as a guest today, back with us is Gil T. Welcome, Gil. Nice to have you again here. Thank you. So uh, an important question for you today. So can workout intensity and or frequency cause you to metabolize your TRT dose more quickly? And how would this affect your total and free T levels? Okay, that's a valid question. The short answer is yes, in a nutshell because metabolism is simply the process of all anabolic and catabolic activities in the human body. So every single variable that occurs throughout your daily life will affect your metabolism. This includes dramatically your activity, the type, the frequency, and the intensity, your sleep, your nutrition, your medications, your hormones, etc. So every variable that is altered will have an effect on overall metabolism. Now, we know testosterone is an anabolic hormone, which means that it helps to rebuild and rebuild proteins essentially, uh, because most of the things in your body are derived from amino acids and converted into proteins. They're essentially, we're, we're made of protein, right? So. These proteins are going to be produced at a faster rate when you're in an anabolic state. We know that exercise in its nature is catabolic. It is the process of breaking down proteins or specifically muscle fiber if we're referring to resistance training. And then the anabolic effect of nutrition, sleep, recovery uh, with the help of proper hormone balance is the anabolic effect of rebuilding what we've demolished essentially. Exercise will increase the rate of catabolism and therefore require more anabolism in order to repair the damage. So naturally testosterone is going to increase the efficacy of rebuilding or repairing the destruction that you've caused via training. The harder and more frequently you train, the more anabolic response you'll need in order to come back bigger, better, and stronger. In addition to that, the breakdown of muscle tissue will release more levels of creatinine, which is the most potent or most abundant protein in muscle. And creatinine will have an effect on the filtration rate in the kidneys. When it is abundant in the bloodstream, it diminishes renal function which is why GFR, which is the, the metric we use in your blood work to determine the overall health of kidneys, creatinine is one of the ma you know, major variables used in that GFR formula. So it'll falsely be elevated, indicating potential renal issues, but it will actually be elevated as a result of muscle breakdown. So when your kidneys are taxed, the excretion of hormones, as well as other metabolites in your body, will be slowed down potentially. When your liver is taxed, which we know also liver enzymes because liver metabolizes not only food but also medications, when your liver enzymes are elevated, the rate of metabolism in the liver is going to be altered and cholesterol and sex hormone binding globulin will be altered. And we know that free T is directly derived of testosterone that is unbound by sex hormone binding globulin. So what I'm getting at here is this is a fairly complex equation. The short answer is yes. The long answer is we have to consider changes to SHBG, changes to hepatic function, changes to renal function, changes to metabolism and excretion, and the overall need of your body to have a repair agent or an anabolic response to the catabolic stimulus caused by the training. So yeah, you're going to likely have lower testosterone levels, free testosterone levels, when you train compared to someone who doesn't train. Now, let me put a caveat on this. It doesn't mean you shouldn't train. It doesn't mean you should be concerned. It doesn't even mean you should adjust your dose frequency or overall protocol. It just means that to answer this direct question with a direct answer, the answer is yes. Whether or not it needs to be 
addressed for an individual comes down to the individual and a provider who's competent enough to understand all of the variables that go into this. I don't want people watching this video to go out there and start saying, well, because I train, I need to do A, B, and C with my protocol. Again, just understand the context of what it is that I said here. And ultimately, you really shouldn't be too concerned about adjusting your testosterone because you happen to be someone that goes to the gym. Mm -hmm. And the same goes probably for uh, total muscle mass. The more muscle mass you have, the more breakdown. Again, muscle mass is one variable of many. There are people that can have a lot of muscle mass and, and they really don't train to the level of someone who has less muscle mass but trains with more intensity and more intent in general. I'll give you an example. Someone who performs CrossFit will have far more muscle breakdown than someone who just performs weightlifting. Mm -hmm. Because you can go to the gym for 45 minutes and work you know, back and biceps in bodybuilding you know, isolation format compared to someone who is working in an anaerobic state of breaking down muscle tissue under fatigue and working very high repetitions for a short period of time and they're going to get more severe muscle breakdown. So rhabdomyolysis is a very serious life-threatening kidney disease which usually we find in people who perform high intensity training under fatigue and usually it is coupled with a state of dehydration. Not very common in a bodybuilder, extremely common in CrossFit and high intensity type sports. So this comes back down to muscle breakdown and the kidney not being able to handle the overload of the metabolites of the muscle breakdown, uh, which leads to rhabdo. So I wouldn't say someone with bigger muscle mass per se is at more risk. I would say it comes down to several variables that all have to be considered together. Mm -hmm. The other question that was there, um, I don't know if it's important to answer. Uh, will your levels still fluctuate while taking exogenous tests? Absolutely, because exogenous testosterone, much like endogenous testosterone, let, let's start with where, where they differ. Where they differ is the cycle or the rhythm of peaks and valleys. We know that the circadian cycle of following a 24-hour sleep clock, we're going to peak through the night into the morning and we're gonna to start to decline and then we're gonna turn that negative feedback loop back on and start to produce testosterone again. When you take an exogenous testosterone, you're gonna have more stable levels. The things that are going to affect the ups and downs of that cycle, while they may not be pituitary slash gonadotropic in nature, they're still going to be affected no differently by the things we just discussed, which is your lifestyle, your exercise, your nutrition, and your body's demand for anabolic response. And again, free testosterone is going to be a direct derivative related to SHBG. And when SHBG starts to fluctuate based on hepatic function and other lifestyle decisions, you're going to notice that the free T is then uh, uh, fluctuating as well. Now, when you have more demand, your free T is going to be diminished sooner. When you have more excretion via the kidneys, your free T is going to be diminished sooner. And this is why we adjust frequency for many guys. And yet another reason why I'm a big fan of injectable testosterone, because it gives us that fine-tuning ability of adjusting frequency. This is something that is lost with a transdermal or topical application that is required to be done twice a day, ideally. Mm -hmm. We don't have the luxury of playing with frequency for the individual response after a dialing period. So that's, that's one more metric that we like to, uh, to follow is frequency, and that is adjusted for the individual. Mm -hmm. Would uh, mimicking uh, the daily uh, fluctuation by injecting daily or a daily application of the transdermal cream, wouldn't that be more natural or more healthy than, for example, injecting once a week? Let's separate the terms more natural and more healthy because they're mutually exclusive. More natural, yeah, it would mimic a more natural cycle. It's still not natural. It would certainly mimic a more natural cycle. More natural doesn't mean optimal. 
because if the term natural equaled optimal, we wouldn't be treating anyone for anything. We would just let everyone be natural, okay? Getting diabetes when you're 55 years old is quite a natural process, but it's not optimal. Getting osteoporosis when you're post-menopause as a woman is quite natural, but it isn't optimal, okay? S losing your libido and your sexual function as you begin to age is quite natural, but it is far from optimal. So chasing quote-unquote natural is not the idea behind regenerative and anti-aging medicine, or we wouldn't be having this conversation. Mm -hmm. So I want to make that distinction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but, but then again, um, if you have the choice for more frequent injection, in most cases, it's better, right? You have to define the reason why. I'm not opposed to the notion if you can explain why it's better. Mm -hmm. Well, if we go to the one extreme, one injection for every 12 weeks, like with Nibidu, right. of, every, of every two weeks, like with Sustenant, that can't be good. Uh, injecting no but like you said before that is an extreme there are there is a middle ground and again it's an individual thing that we need to address uh, certainly a daily protocol is going to be better than the extreme of too infrequent mm -hmm. but can I sit here and say that daily is better than twice a week or three times a week not necessarily there also comes real world considerations here that are less scientific it's still scientific because adherence is, is still statistically scientific, but it is not specifically scientific to biochemistry. So you may have biochemical advantages over daily, but you may be one of those people that forgets or is inconvenienced by daily injections. And therefore, in theory, it may be better for you, but in the real world, it translates into missed doses, and therefore less milligrams per week Whereas if we just told you to go, let's say, Tuesdays and Fridays, you would hit your dose more consistently. So similarly to diet, as I've told you a couple of years back in a nutrition video we did, I can give you a scientifically bulletproof 100% plan. If you only do 70% of it, then that is your weak point. You're only getting 70%. I'd rather give you a plan that's 85% solid and know that you're going to do 100% of it and get the 85. No different here. Um, I find it very seldom where a patient who is on a quote-unquote daily protocol actually adheres to a proper daily protocol without missing doses. Yeah. So there's real-world applications versus, you know, hypoth hypothetical theories. The theory may look good on paper, but in the real world, it doesn't always translate into that. So that's why we try to meet people where they're at and try to actually address and prescribe a treatment option that is is going to be adhered and then we have more control over what's going on because oftentimes guys will tell you they're doing everything 100 percent because they're embarrassed or they feel like you're going to be mad at them if they admit to not doing it right and then you're over here scratching your head saying i don't understand why this is not working when he's telling me everything is going as planned when it really isn't i'd rather kind of just actually make sure that we understand what a guy is doing that's clear my friends thank you for all the knowledge you always share it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for the opportunity to do, to do just that. And if you want to find out what the best time is to inject your testosterone, go and watch this video right now.